Right, welcome to this mock on um, chemistry unit one and it covers C1, C2 and C3. 60 marks, um, 20 pages and firstly we're into a six mark question. Now it is crucial that you read this information. So we've got a table. Um, firstly though, let's uh, just read the question carefully. So they're giving us some clues. So they're on about they're talking about the Earth's early atmosphere. They mention it's volcanic activity. Um, they say the Earth's early atmosphere was mainly carbon dioxide and water vapor. And then they're talking about a table that shows important changes um, that have occurred. So we've got the early atmosphere got 500 years ago and we've got today's atmosphere. Now what it's telling us to do and this is important because otherwise we might end up doing things that we don't need to is explain how changes in percentage of carbon dioxide and oxygen took place. So that means we can pretty much ignore some of this question. We can ignore nitrogen and we can ignore water vapour. Otherwise we're wasting our time, we don't want to waste our time. Um, what we'd then do is we'd have a look at how it's changing, okay? So oxygen increases and then stays the same. Carbon dioxide decreases and then increases in the last 500 years. So we're basically going to be explaining three things. We're going to structure this answer in such a way that we explain the CO2 uh, decrease, sorry, the oxygen increase, and then most recently the CO2 increase. And I'd probably try and go for that order because that way it's in a chronological order. Um, and what we'd have to think about would brainstorm our ideas, so CO2, so we're going to be thinking probably about photosynthesis, okay, and that would apply to oxygen as well. We might think about the oceans. Um, we might think about rocks and how some gases can get trapped within rocks. Um, and we'll definitely think more recently about human activity. Um, and then we'll try and structure that, okay? Maybe we'll definitely mention fossil fuels. So just in planning my answer, I've pretty much I've structured it here. Um, and I've managed to get my key ideas here. And I noticed a lot of you in the mock exams did actually do this kind of structuring and it does make a massive difference. Okay, so answer that one and then we'll move on. Um, so. so next question. And we're faced with one that could potentially be a bit trickier. Okay, so the atmosphere today may contain pollutant gases. Steps have been taken to reduce the amount. And then it talks about flue gases from power stations containing sulfur dioxide. And it says sulfur dioxide can be removed by reacting it with calcium hydroxide. It makes a solid product and water. Name the solid product. Now, if you know it, that's fine. If not, um, there's maybe a way of kind of figuring it out. Okay, so we've got this information. Um, we know we've got sulfur dioxide. I'm just going to write it as a symbol, which you'll probably know. Um, and we've got calcium hydroxide. Now I know calcium hydroxide is this. So what you've got to think then, we're getting water removed so we can kind of forget um, about some of this, this OH, and we can have a, a guess at, you know, calcium 
and we've got some sulfur and we've got some oxygen left, um, we'd always write the name of the metal first and then we'll just try and have a, a, a guess, an educated guess about what the remaining part would be thinking about this sulfur and oxygen we've got left over. Um, then complete the sentence about the reaction. The reaction between calcium and hydroxide and sulfur hydroxide because calcium hydroxide is right. Well, there aren't many clues here. Um, what is a clue? Is hydroxide. Now we've done about hydroxides in um, C7, and we know something about hydroxide. So even though we might not know this directly from, say, the revision guide or from being taught we might be able to link it to something we've done elsewhere. So think about what hydroxides are. Um, again, hard question. Uh, next one, another process uses limestone to remove sulfur dioxide. This reaction makes a solid product, again, and carbon dioxide. Suggests a disadvantage of using calcium carbonate rather than calcium hydroxide. Well, this time they've very kindly given us it in the question. Now, if you just say it produces carbon dioxide, that's probably not enough to get you a mark because you've got to link it, you've got to explain why it's a disadvantage. Okay, so you use that information and just explain it a little bit. That's the key thing. If you think the mark is too easy, sometimes it is. You've got to expand on things. So, nine marks done. Move on to question two. And we've got a graph. Okay, so scientists investigating um, nitrogen dioxide concentration. Oops. Nitrogen dioxide concentration in the air next to a city road, and it's over a 24 hour period. Um, got a graph, and on the graph, we can see we've got kind of two peaks um, one here, which works out around maybe about 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. And we've got another here, uh, which is, what, about 5 o'clock. So straight away, I'm thinking 9, and I'm thinking 5. And even if I don't do anything else with this graph, I'm going to be thinking, right, 9 to 5. People working. Don't know what the rest of the question's about, but it's probably a good idea to interpret, have a quick look at the graph, quick scan, before anything else. So now, oh, right, so we've got some people. So it says the World Health Organization um, has suggested limits for nitrogen dioxide concentrations, and we've got two different values, okay? So we've got 200 micrograms per meter cube for one hour, and 40 micrograms per meter cubed for annual exposure. So some students are discussing these limits as they look on the graph. Uh, so we've got, got, I think, five different statements. Yeah, we've got another one down there. Um, we've got Ali. So Ali's talking about, well, he's really linking it to this one, so we'll kind of highlight this blue. Okay, 40, 40 micrograms. Um, then Beth. He's talking about the 200 microgram limit. Carl's talking about the 200 microgram limit. God knows what Dan's talking about. And then we've got Ed, again, who's making another type of statement, okay? And it's worth looking at this, and just by looking at this, I can kind of like narrow down my options maybe later on in the questions. So let's have a look at what question says. Whose comments show that one of the WHO limits has been exceeded? So I can ignore Ed and Dan. And I've got a look at Ali, Beth, and Cal. Okay, so cross check with my two statements and see which one of those suggests the limit has been broken. And then whose comment shows that no conclusion could be made about the W, the other WH limit from the evidence in this graph? Well, I'm probably going to be thinking about Ed and Dan at this time. I'm trying to work it out from those because the other ones are statements about data. Um, next, we've got, and yeah, I was kind of maybe expecting something like this. So, um, number of vehicles, okay, and we've got the number of vehicles given 
a lot of data here, okay? But we can see a general pattern of increasing, then decreasing, and then increasing, and then decreasing. Okay, much like the graph does, okay? Now the key thing with this next question is it says use the information from the tables to explain the shape of the graph. Now that's important. We're going to have to say why that graph is like it is. We're not going to describe it. We're not going to say, oh well there's a correlation, okay? Necessarily and just leave it at that. We've got to explain it. Okay, so I would firstly try and describe why there's a link, okay, or say some facts about it, um, talk about, I'd, I'd probably start with the idea of a correlation between the two variables and go into a bit of detail about that, and then I'd try and explain it. Um, when I'm explaining it, I'm trying to think where has this NO2 come from? And we can probably get a simple mark and then maybe, because it's three marks, we can maybe explain it a bit further, thinking about how NO2 is formed. Um, then we've got scientists repeating this investigation on a second day. Um, it's got measurements at 9 a.m. Okay, now all these samples from one time. And it says the sample for, the measurement for sample two is much higher than the other measurements. Okay, so we've got this one. And it is indeed a fair bit higher, around about 20. Um, what should the scientists consider when deciding whether or not to include this value in their calculation of the best estimates? Well, for this, we've really got to think of a couple of different things. So, we want to consider the range of the other values. How far is it away? Does that justify it being an outlier? So can we, is that going to justify it? I mean, we don't need to decide if it's an outlier, but that's one thing a scientist would consider when they've got a value that's different to the others. How far away is it in terms of its range? Um, and the other thing we'd have to consider is why have we got it? Okay, so we'd, we'd try and think, you know, what might have happened at this time to give us a higher value? Um, so it might well be a correct value, but we'll want to kind of have a reason for that. So we'd need to think about what might cause nitrogen dioxide to be higher. Okay, and remember, it's not going to be any, it, sh it shouldn't technically be any different to the others if it was to do, because they're all recording like the same number of cars, etc. Okay, so it's got to be another factor. Um, next, scientists use these results to work out the best estimates. Okay, and they get this value, 284 micrograms per meters cubed. Um, look at the nitrogen dioxide concentration on a 9 a.m. for the graph on day one. And we've just got to suggest the difference between the two values. So this should be really straightforward. Um, what you've got to be clear is if you're linking it to the number of cars, you're making clear which is when you're talking about day one and when you're talking about day two. So you've got to be really specific, just saying uh, there were more cars or something along that line would not be enough to get you the mark. You need to be clear, and that's probably why they've highlighted day one and day two. That's a clue. Uh, then we get on to electrically powered cars. Um, so, saying the use in many cities may not, so again, we've got some bold, be the ideal solution to air pollution problems. Um, put ticks in the boxes next to the three statements, okay, and it is important we therefore tick three. Some people in the mocks didn't do that, 
when they were given a number. Um, when taken together, they give the best explanation for this. Okay, so what I do is go through process of elimination. So fossil fuels are burned to generate ele mental electricity. Okay, well, that sounds feasible because they do get the electricity from the mains grid. Fossil fuels are non-renewable and will run, to run out. Again, that sounds a reasonable statement, but does it link to this idea of an air pollution problem? Uh, as fossil fuels are burnt, polluting gases are given off. Again, statement's correct. Does it link to that? Electric cars give out polluting gases as they're used. Well, I think that's the first one that we've got to look at. Where we're probably going to think, well, that's not even a right statement. Um, electric cars have batteries that are charged from the mains electricity supply. Again, that's true, and it kind of links with some of the other statements. Um, the batteries in electric cars have to be replaced every few years. Again, it's true. Does it link with this? Does it link with the idea of air pollution? So we should be able, from that, to narrow it down to five and then further narrow it down to two. Um, next, question number three, and I think we're moving on to C2 now. Um, company plans to make a new rope for sailing boats. Right, so we're thinking about properties, materials. Uh, must be strong and stretchy. Uh, the test ropes from five polymers. So we've got five polymers, A, B, C, and D, and E. I want to know which is the best polymer. Um, they measure how much each rope stretches and they do this until the rope breaks. And importantly, I don't know if there's going to be any questions about control variables, but we've got some control variables there. And we've got results in the graph. So it ends when the rope breaks. So before I do anything else, before I even have a look at the question, I'm going to try and just just to understand what's going on. So, um, on this axis, the bottom one, as we go across, there's a greater load. So the further it goes across here, so for example, E, um, the more load it'll take before it breaks. And then on this axis, we've got stretch okay so the higher it goes up here the more it stretches so you can see that for example E and C take a lot of uh, mass before they break and then B D and A and then A is number one stretchiness B is number two C is number three and D is number four and E is number five so we've kind of got considering both axes are Scientists, oh, so the scientists make sure that all factors except the type of polymer are identical for each test. Explain why. Well, just like when we're thinking about um, our controlled assessments, okay, we always want only one factor to affect the outcome. Okay, so we try and explain it in those terms. Um, we won't be talking about things like a fair test because that's pretty much key stage three. Um, but we do want to talk about only one factor affecting the outcome and then maybe try and expand on that because it's worth two marks, okay? And explain the importance of that, why that's important. Uh, look at the graph. Is there a link between the stretchiness of their ropes and their strength? Um, well, go back up, so stretchiness and strength, well, doesn't look like there's a particular pattern. 
I mean, if we look at our graph, we've kind of got a bit of a negative correlation here. So as stretchiness decreases, force increases, but then we've got this one. So I guess we could phrase it in one of two ways. We've either got a pattern, if we exclude D, or because of D, we haven't really got a pattern. Okay, then we'd maybe talk about that general correlation. Um, and then we'd, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd think about this, okay, these ones in particular. And use like an example maybe to help explain what we are trying to say. It's only two marks, but you just want to make sure you have made as many points as possible. Then it says A and E are different forms of the same polymer. What differences in the structure of the polymers could have caused these differences in their properties? So firstly, going back up. So A is stretchy, but not very strong. E is not very stretchy, but strong. Okay, so A is stretchy. E is not stretchy, but it's strong. Oops. Um, so we've got a few different statements and we want to check them out each, okay? So E has less plasticizer than polymer A. Well, plasticizers increase flexibility, so we'll have to see if that's right. E has cross-link chains, but polymer A does not. Well, cross-links um, improve strength, so I'll have to check if that works. Polymer E is less crystalline than polymer A, while crystallinity increases strength. This is less crystalline, so it decreases strength. E has shorter chains than polymer A, so shorter chains, they decrease strength, so we'll have to see if that works. And polymer E has fewer crosslinks than polymer A, so again, link into the idea of crosslinks, okay, and crosslinks increase strength. So we'd have to decide from that which match this pattern. Um, next one, ropes made of different polymer molecules. Again, they've highlighted that. So now what they're doing is saying, right, ignore what you've just done in the previous question. We're now thinking about different polymer molecules. Um, I have different breaking strengths. Use the ideas about forces and molecules to explain why. Okay, so... As soon as these, I see these words... Forces and molecules, it's a massive hint, and the massive hint is to intermolecular forces. I mean, they basically spelled it out in the question. So if we can say some kind of pattern involving intermolecular forces, we're going to be pretty much there. Um, company then, so part C, company chooses to make the new rope from polymer C. Suggest why they use this polymer rather than any of the others, okay? So polymer C, if you remember, is kind of somewhere midway, okay? So we have to think of the two criteria, and they were, it was quite stretchy. Yeah, it was strong. So we'll have to say how it matches those criteria, and then compare it with the others, because that's what we want to do. We want to say why... We're not using the others. Okay, so we've got to include that. So comparing with the criteria that they set out, compare it with the other ropes. Um, next one. Uh, we start off with crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons. Which elements are present in a hydrocarbon? Well, clues in the name. Um, the hydrocarbons in crude oil are used to make. By the way, that's an example of a mark that you can probably get within about five seconds. Save some time, move on, don't worry about it. Okay, don't even think about that much. Uh, next one, B. The hydrocarbons in crude oil are used to make fuels, lubricants, and raw materials for chemical synthesis. Okay, so plastics, for example. Uh, some of the following statements are true and some are false. Okay, so two marks. With these, we want to try and get as much as possible, and remember, we're talking about crude oil. So... 
molecules of different sizes. Okay, makes sense. Most of the hydrocarbon molecules are used in chemical synthesis. Well, we've got to think where are actually most of them used. Okay, it should be reasonably obvious. All of the hydrogen hydrocarbon molecules can be burnt as fuels. All of the hydrocarbon molecules can be polymerized. Right. Um, for this one, whenever I see these words, all, I start to get suspicious. Generally, when the word all is included, and it is a general thing, we have to be suspicious of that. Could all the hydrocarbon molecules be burnt as fuels, even the very longest ones? Um, can all be polymerized? Well, even the very longest ones. So we've got to think, you know, can, can it apply to every single thing? Okay, and then we get a diagram of uh, fractional distillation. And it's kind of given us some data here. We've got a picture. Um, and it's worth just kind of going through. So um, this one has very few carbon atoms per fraction. This one's got very many. This one's got a very high uh, boiling point. This one's got a low boiling point. It would be a gas at room temperature. Um, so scroll down, now we've got a pattern. And it's a six marker, so it says use the information opposite to describe the link. So I've got the link between this oh, link between the size of the molecules in each fraction and the temperature at which the fraction boils. Okay. Doesn't seem particularly hard. And indeed, looking at the mark scheme, just look brought it up for this one. This one's an example of six marker on high paper targeted uh, C grids. This one would also appear on the foundation paper. So then says, explain this pattern using ideas about forces, molecular size, and the way in which molecules are arranged in liquids and gases. So they've kind of spelt out what we're going to have to do. So this question is quite nice in that it's it's leading us through it. So, the first thing we'd want to do is write that link. Okay. Um, and you could maybe include examples of that. Okay, so often it's a good idea when you do kind of a correlation or a relationship they include examples to explain it. Uh, then we want to move on to forces slash molecule size. So we're going to be thinking about essentially when we're just talking about molecule size, we're going to be thinking about chain length. And we're going to be thinking about intermolecular forces. Um, and then finally, it says the way in which molecules are arranged in liquids and gases. So we're going to um, talk about particle arrangements in gases and liquids. And then we might try and link that to um, size of the molecule. And boiling point. And maybe explain what's, what's happening here. And one of the key things, because we're talking about boiling point, we really must talk about the energy needed to essentially overcome 
those bonds or those forces between the chains and separate them and once they're separated then there will be a gas and they will have boiled okay so energy is a crucial crucial idea in this in this one okay uh, then we move on to uh, this one that we saw the other day I think so we've got um, a question about plasticizers so plasticizers are added to the polymer PVC to make it more flexible Uh, two six markers in a, in a row, by the way. Some plasticizers are mere leach out. Okay, so it's added to make it flexible. Mere leach out of the polymer and contaminate the environment. And we've got people disagreeing about the size of the risks. Uh, so we've got um, this man, businessman, so we'll colour him in red. I think there is almost no risk in using plasticizers. There is no evidence that they've caused any person to become ill. Now notice he's a spokesman for a plastic manufacturer so we've got to think immediately about bias in that statement. And then we've got public pressure group man. Uh, so we have called for the plasticizers to be banned, shown to harm rats and they build up in people's bodies. Okay. Now, they've given us some information there, and I think we'd probably start by almost rehashing some of that information. So, so this kind of thing, I'd probably plan it slightly differently. Um, so firstly, I think I'd spend a bit of time talking about the risks. So I've already said about rats, but then are rats the equivalent of humans? Would it have the same effect? Um, we can talk about leaching out. Now one of the things they're used for is in cling film. We need to know that. Um, and then would think about accumulation, which again is mentioned in the preamble that they've described. So then we'll have considered the risks, okay? And then would maybe think about relative risk. So is it proven? Is the data applicable to humans? So is it valid? And then finally, we'd think about maybe why people might have these views. And one of the things that comes up often on OCI is the idea of benefit versus risk. So some people might think it's valid to have some kind of risk for the benefit. Other people might disagree and would think about bias um, and maybe vested interests okay and that should pretty much cover it we're not actually including much science the only science we might have to know is this idea about kind of like the plasticizers being used in cling film and then leaching out from that and that's why it affects food okay so I'll move on um, and it says the life cycle of a plasticized PVC product that is used in people's homes include these four stages. Right, okay, so we're on about life cycles now, life cycle assessment. Um, so it's got four stages, A, B, C, D. Um, and it says at which stage would members of the public be most at risk from plasticizers? Well, that should be fairly obvious. At which stage would workers be most at risk? Again, fairly obvious. So these ones are absolute slam dunk, no problem questions, okay? Quickly do, move on, and then spend a bit more time on the six markers. Um, to make a personal decision about whether or not the risks involved in the use of plasticizers are acceptable, what information would you need? Now, this time, it's in put ticks in the boxes next to the two best answers. So it might be that some of them are reasonable, but others are more reasonable. 
So, again, we're thinking about the risks involved. Are they acceptable? So the probability that you suffer harmful effects, that seems reasonable answer. The benefits of using plasticizer in PC, well, potentially, because if we're thinking about are the risks worthwhile, maybe the benefits it's worth considering. I have to think if it's going to be one of our best answers. How much PVC is manufactured in the UK each year? Well, that doesn't really seem to relate very well. What harmful effects plasticizers can cause are the concentrations involved? Well, that seems very reasonable. Okay, because we do, we're interested in the level of risk. The chemical formula? Well, we don't care about that. And which manufacturers make it? Again, not really relevant. So we've got three that are relevant, and we've just got to pick the two best answers, okay? Because all three are valid, two are probably more valid. Right, on C3, so we've got sodium chloride. Um, used in the food industry, and it's used to treat icy roads in winter. Uh, it contains rock fragments and grit, so that's rock salt. Most of this salt is used to treat icy roads in winter. So just why this salt is particularly useful to treat icy roads, okay? Now, when we're reading this, okay, it's on about this salt, and it does make a point of saying this salt. So we're not just talking about any salt, okay? We're talking about the salt with grit in it. Um, suggest why this salt is not used in the food industry. So again, we can link it back to what's stated in the question. Um, salt for the chemical industry can be obtained by solution mining. So we've just got to describe that. Okay, so we can think of maybe our little diagram that we see in the textbook. Where let's go down, up, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and describe and explain an environmental problem. So, this one, describe and explain. So, you're going to state it and then explain why it's a problem. Okay, so you've got to think when you're doing this and you're removing this salt, what problem could it cause? Okay. Bit of a tricky question that. Again, if you think it's too hard, you move on, come back to it. Uh, next one. By passing electricity through salt solution, right, so we've got electrolysis, that's what I'm immediately thinking. Um, there are three useful products can be made, and it shows the electrolysis cell for the process. Um, now we've got various arrows, we've got A, C, B, hydrogen and waste water so we're going to be thinking we're probably going to need something to do with A, B and C and indeed we do alright so it says complete the table to show the names of each of these three chemicals choose words from this list so they've been kind, they've given us a list now A if we have a look well it must be a gas because hydrogen's given off there as well and it seems to be rising up. So with A, we can probably think which ones could be A. Well, sodium carbonate solid, sodium chloride solid, could be chlorine, could be nitrogen, sodium hydroxide is usually dissolved in water. So it's going to be between those two. Um, B and C the clues are in the arrowheads. Okay, so C, it's going in. B, it's going out. So essentially, we're thinking C is reactant. Oops. And B is a product. So 
So remember, we're using salt water, brine, okay, and it's producing three different things, one of which we've already stated, or one of which has already been stated in the question. Um, then we move on a bit, something a bit contextual. So it says one industrial use of salt is to make the alkali sodium carbonate. So we're making an alkali. Um, says there are large underground deposits of salt in the northwest of England, resulted in the development of an industry to make sodium carbonate. And the diagram below shows the process used to make, uh, used to produce sodium carbonate. So we've got, and it's worth looking at this diagram in detail, we've got lots and lots of products. So salt, which we know lots of in the northwest of England, sulfuric acid, limestone, coal, all these four things are involved. Um, so what we've got to think, it says, use the diagram to suggest two other reasons why the alkali industry developed in the northwest of England. So we've got to think and probably we're going to be thinking about, and this is already a clue in the question, okay? So we've got large underground deposits of salt in the northwest of England. So that's giving us a clue, that's telling us that this thing's available there. Again, for something to to be um, economically viable in industry, you want a lot of your raw materials to be available there so you don't have to transport them around the world. So we've got to think, we've got three of the raw materials, which of these three do we think is going to be available in the northwest of England in plentiful supply? And I think it's probably quite easy to work out which ones that's going to be. Okay, and that's, that's the end of the exam. Not too bad, really fairly straightforward apart from um, maybe a couple of the six mark questions. And we want to be getting, we want to be getting high marks on this because it's harder to get high marks on the unit sevens. So when you go into these exams, the core exams, and they do seem fairly straightforward, just be thinking, right, I want, I want to be getting about 50 here, 50, and then I'm going to be get a good A star, and that will allow us to maybe drop a couple of marks on the unit sevens if things don't go quite correctly.